Well, the reason I've invited parents, and that this is hopefully going to be recorded well enough that we can use it as a fire, uh, firefly resource, is because do you know what, guys? Do you think music's really hard? And I have lots of questions from parents about how to help uh, you learn to set works. And I just thought it would be good. This gives parents an insight into what you have to know, but also hopefully be an interesting and exciting experience. I have heard the rehearsals of this, which is very, very cool. So I think you're going to really enjoy hearing the two performances. So this is the way this is going to run. We're going to do one, we start with music for a while, and that will involve me talking about it, and we'll be picking the bits and bobs out, and then we'll have a full performance, and then we'll do the Beethoven. I know for year 11, you studied this, so this should be revision. Year 10, you haven't touched these yet. Okay, so don't let this overwhelm you. Um, if it's just easier for you to listen to me chat and listen, do that. Don't be too overwhelmed by the bits of paper in front of you. Does that make sense? I'm going to take this off because this is going to keep hitting the music stand, but I'm me, honest. Um, so, we are going to start with music for what? I don't, I'm just going to say phones off, please. Or silent, non contactable. And also, even though there's a lot of chat, this needs to have the vibe of a concert. Okay, so please be respectful at all times. I know I don't really need to say that, but you guys have probably never been to anything like this before. You've been to concerts plenty of times, but not. This is called a lecture recital, which sounds very formal, but I hope you're quite interested. So let's stop with music for a while. So, written in 1692 by Henry Purcell, which means, we know, that is, means it's a Baroque piece. And you can tell it's Baroque for various reasons. Um, there is a harpsichord, which sounds like this. Yes? Beautifully played, yes? So the harpsichord is different to the piano, in the sense that inside a piano you've got steel strings hit by wooden hammers. In a harpsichord, You've got hammers that have got little um, hooks on them that pluck the string. So actually the harpsichord is considered a string instrument because it's not hit, it's plucked, which is why it's got that quite twangy sound. We also know, because even the attends who've studied bark, that that means in the harpsichord you can't do loud and soft. It tends to be one very static dynamic. Okay, so there's the harpsichord, there's lots of ornamentation, which actually without realising it, because she's so awesome, this is more like has already demonstrated, and she was just playing there, she naturally ornamented, which means putting twiddly bits on, trills, mordants, grace notes, and we'll talk more about them in a minute. And the other thing that makes it very typically, typically Baroque is the ground bass. Now I know my year 11s love singing the ground bass, but could you, uh, would you mind playing it for us, please, Mrs. Longasmos? That bass line is repeated over and over again. That is a very Baroque thing. You all know, so I'm going to be moving about here because that's my favourite thing to do. You will probably know this piece of music. She's pretty vicious, she's got snakes for hair, blood eyes, back wings, and she, her job is to make to, to sort of hound the guilty, okay? And the whole point of music for a while is that it's about music, it's so calming guys, we know that even in the stress of GCSEs, but it even makes Electo chill out, okay? That's what this is about. 
Um, usually, it's sung by tenor. Could be tenor or soprano. Obviously, today it's the wonderful Hannah who's singing it for us. Um, and what we have, you would also normally have, and I've decided not to play this because I think we couldn't do the two at the same time, you'd have a harpsichord with a continuo, which would mean the bass line would be also played by a cello or a bass viol or a bassoon. In this piece on the recording that you have, it's a bass viol, which is a lot like a cello, but a cello has four strings and no frets, because we have to be geniuses to play the cello. A bass viol has six strings and frets, which means you can see where to put your fingers, okay? So, um, I'm going to just ask you to sing me the first little section, would that be okay? So maybe go up to uh, Shall All Your Cares Beguile, so just before, before, yeah. just before it gets all the time. So. Um, what we had there is a really good example of some of the text setting. So if I talk about words being syllabic, we've talked about that in Defying Gravity Year 10, I know we've talked about it Year 11. So that, this is mainly syllabic, which means there is a word for each note, a syllable for each note. So music, music, here's a bit of melisma for a while. Okay, Hannah, could you just give us some, could you sing? Literally those two lines for us. Mm -hmm. The first two. You can go, yeah. So that's completely syllabic. She doesn't sing for a while. That would be syllabic. So the difference having having melisma and syll syllabic writing makes it more interesting. Um, other important melisma moments tie in with the word painting. This is important, guys. Word painting. Word painting is when the music that you're singing reflects the words that you're saying. And later on, in a few bars, we have the words. Wondering, okay? That could be when you're thinking, it just takes a little while. It's not a, it's not a straightforward thing. And what you see here is a lovely melisma going from the top of the scale right down to the bottom. She doesn't say wondering, wondering, that would be syllabic. Whereas what we have is a lovely section of work. Can we have wondering, please? <laughs> Yeah? It's not a nice sound. 
Then when we get to the eased, would you mind playing the eased moment? So when something's eased, the pain is eased, it's a relief. Eased, eased, like that. And we have this falling, eased moment that fits really nicely with the bass line. Sorry, this is my last one, so go for it. Okay, so you can feel that sense of ease is reflected in the music. Purcell's a genius. He's got all this going on. If you're not studying it for GCSE, you're not even sitting there going, oh yeah, there's a grand bass, I can hear that going on. It's all happening over the top of this. It's so, so clever. Um, so throughout this, we have some more word painting on the word eternal. Okay. Can we skip forward to the word eternal? Now, you might find that having to sit listening to Mr. Talkins talking about set works on a Thursday afternoon feels pretty eternal, but it's not. Here is an example of a word. Obviously, eternal is a long time, isn't it? So if we go to page, ooh, where's a good, ooh, how's a good way to get into that noise? There is an upbeat to yeah. bar 19 from. Go for, yes. Okay. So go from, from, from there, yes. yes. Right, go for it, please. Bottom of page 33 from. Okay. This has a very small range, isn't it? 
Yes. It's got a range of a ninth. So it sits kind of right in the middle of your range. It doesn't go particularly high, doesn't go particularly low. So it's, it's, it's incidental music. This isn't a music for uh, the soprano to go, hey, look at me, I'm doing amazing things. This is music that is for a play. Um, so it's not really showing off it. Um, the melody is mainly conjunct. Conjunct, guys, that's a good word, means moves in step. Okay, it's immediately disproved the first bit. Music, music, okay, that's a fifth. But that's a nice, easy interval. Most of it is scalic or conjunct or next to each other. Um, there are some sequences. We spotted one earlier. Wandering, wandering, okay? Do you remember a sequence is an idea that's repeated higher or lower? So melodically, it's very Baroque, it's not crazy. There are loads of ornaments. Now, because I'm nice, and also because I forget, on the back of this, I've given you a little crib sheet about what an ornament looks like and what it sounds like, okay? Because it's quite tricky. This piece of music has trills. This is my boss. Could you play me a trill, please? Could you play me a mordant? An upper mordant? A lower mordant? Okay, very subtly different, but you need to know all of these things, guys. Um, it has grace notes of plenty. It's Baroque. If it can ornament, it will. If a note is too long, it will do something to it. In fact, just an interesting fact about string players, it's not that interesting, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, when you're a string player in the Baroque period, you wouldn't use vibrato, so that's that wobbly thing that makes the music sound really nice. In romantic music, they do that all the time. In Baroque, that's considered an ornament, and they only use it on a very long note, okay? So, it's one of those things. Ornamentation is really, really important, okay? Let's talk structure. Ground-based structure. We've talked about that already. Dun, 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 dun. But also, this is a very Baroque form of the da capo aria. Now, what you'll see in a minute, that basically means there's an A section, which you've heard mainly, and there's a B section, and then the A section comes back, but it's that's that's the moment to show off. If there is a moment to show off, it's then, and there's even more ornamentation put on. So when you hear that in a minute, you'll go, oh, it's the music, music, oh, I know this bit. But Hannah will start doing things to it, I think, that she hasn't done before. Yeah. And that is because otherwise it gets a bit boring. I go, my, my husband is an opera singer, I go and see him in shows. I remember going to see Cesare, which is a um, piece of my handle. I sat down and I suddenly thought, oh, the capo arias. Yeah, that make everything much longer because you're like, oh, we've got through it. Oh, and then it's repeated. Hello. Um, but the point is the excitement is in the repeat, okay? Um, texture, what do we reckon? Is it polyphonic? Is it homophonic? It's melody dominated homophony. It's tune and accompaniment, very much. Um, and we're in major or a minor key. What do you think, guys? Minor, which would make sense, wouldn't it? Because it's all about the crazy goddess with snake hair and blood coming out of her eyes. It's not, it's not supposed to be that uplifting. It's actually supposed to be quite chill. Um, you'll also notice that this piece is full of quavers. Dun, 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 dun. And the main time that there are dots are in the harpsichord, okay? So it's, a lot of this piece should be quite understandable to you because there's repetition, and actually the important thing about it is the syllabic nature and the melisma. Does anyone have any questions about it? That'd be brave to ask now, wouldn't it? <clears throat> what I want you to do, Tom Francis, I really want you to take your coat off because it's really warm in here. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to listen to Hannah and Mrs. Molasmos for And what I really want you to do is actually put your scores down and just listen. Listen out for the melisma. Listen out for the repeat when music comes back. And listen for the ornamentation, okay? It's not an easy thing to do, stand up and hear and perform. So I'd like you to give them a big round of applause before they start. And mm -hmm. then we'll take
doesn't sell you this at all. You, st you found some things to really cook into when you're listening. You, just, you, you learn everything about it. Well done. Hannah, kind of take a seat. You can relax now. Um, <laughs> right. So. He doesn't hold back. And as you can see on your um, score, you can briefly look through and see, actually I put some of them up here, but it's just, it's full, I haven't put them all up here, it's full of stuff, like P's and FP's and SFT's and FF and these kind of things, telling, telling the performer to exactly what to do. Um, this is a much louder instrument. Probably, this actually is probably a louder instrument even with Beethoven would have used. Um, but what you'll get to see is very cool. Is this is being played really, really well. Um, pathetic does not mean pathetic. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Moving, emotional. So the, the start of the Romantic period. As some people say when Beethoven died, that was the start of the Romantic period. Some say he straddles both. Um, I would I would agree with that actually. I think because he, classical music was very. I would just call it straightforward, four square. You know where it's going. Da, 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 da. Obviously it's going to go. Da, 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 da. It's question and it's answer. And it's being written because someone's paying you to do it. Someone's paying Beethoven to do this as well, but he can write what he likes. He's going to write how he feels. So this feels much more dynamic in the sense of emotion. Um, and he, can, he kind of does what he likes. Which is why, and those of you who haven't already been taught this, I get a little bit frustrated that this is chosen as a set work. Because there's elements of this, for example, the structure, it's in sonata form. If you're trying to teach brilliant young minds about sonata form, this isn't the one you choose, because he doesn't follow the rules. And that's fine, that's cool, but it's actually quite hard. And actually, this is the, you know, you'll see as I explain. So, um, let's talk about the structure. It's in sonata form, which is a huge, hugely important structure for classical and romantic periods. It's got three sections. It's got exposition, where you expose the ideas. It's got a development, where you develop the ideas. And there's got a recapitulation, where you recap the ideas. Okay? And within that first section, the exposition, you have two main themes, which you then develop. This one's okay, again, shows that Beethoven just doesn't care because we don't start with the exposition here. We start with the introduction. Uh, and would you mind just playing the first, the first part? Worth saying, it says grave, it's not grave, it's grave, it means bear slow. Okay? Four beats in a bar, and it's very slow. So, can we just have the first, the first, just literally the first bar? Thank you. Aren't you relieved that all the pages you've got don't go at that speed? Because my gosh, we've been here all night. That's one bar. And in that bar, we've got uh, FP, we've got a diminished seventh. A diminished seventh, which is year 11's favourite chord, is a chord made out of minor thirds. I have a little song. 
that join these things with me, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, it's one of these. It's got, usually got four notes and it crumbles in. Yes. And then it falls in. Yes. Diminished seventh is a crunchy, crunchy chord. It's big romantic. Yeah. Um, sorry, I get a bit excited about the minute seven, sorry. Um, you've got dotted rhythms in this first one, and it feels slow, it's chordal, okay? But the important thing is that six note motif. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You'll hear it all over the place. Occasionally it's two, three, four, five, six, when you start the one. But you'll hear it develop all over the place. So. Within this piece, this first section, and I think I will get you to play all of it, you've got a crazy, look at the bottom. Septuplet, septuplet, crazy, 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 crazy fast chromatic scale, although it's obviously quite still quite sl within a slow tempo. And then, what have I put there? Why was I looking that way? I don't know. Um, <laughs> the pause! Yes! <laughs> there one of these! Which that, which means you hold that note on. This is my last person can hold it on for as long as she likes. So, as we're listening to this intro, I want you to hear the one, two, three, four, five, six. I might do a little dance every time you hear it, because I know that's helpful. Right, take it away, this is my last one. Second 
second subject, we have some moments of broken chords. That's when a chord is played in, with individual notes. And we have a lovely transition section, which is when we change key. Because the important thing, guys, in sonata form, subject one is in the tonic. Subject two is usually in the dominant. This is where I get a bit cross because it's not in the dominant here because it's Beethoven he does what the heck he likes. But it's in a different key. So what you've got is a lovely transi transition section. Would you mind just playing the first, actually the first page into the first miss, yeah. and then over the page. Yeah. Right, here we go. Then over the page guys. 
there's a big old moment where we get ready to get back to chord one for the recapitulation. And I've written, recapitulation, look, it's like bar 11, because it's exactly the same, okay? And then basically, we have to finish in the same key as we started in. So the recapitulation is really similar to the exposition, but he messes around with it a bit to make sure we finish in the right key. That's all I'm going to say about because I don't want to overburden you with too much sonata form talk. I fear I have already. Um, the thing that you really need to take away from this is that it's a, it's a, man, it's a man wrestling with his thoughts. Mozart doesn't feel like that, okay? You hear this and it can only be a romantic composer because there's so much going on. It feels like, I always think this feels like someone's having, someone's having a bad day, they're having a discussion with themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're cross and they've said this and they've done that. So at the beginning, when I talked about the da 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 ba bum ba bum ba bum it feels like they're annoyed with themselves. It, it feels like there's more going on here than just, oh, I've been told to write this because so-and-so is count on what should we call it, it's why it's got a birthday, which is often why music used to be written, okay? So, I'm gonna stop talking now. There's lots more points in here, but if, what I'd like you to do is put your scores away. You're gonna listen for the one, two, three, four, five, six. You're gonna listen for the change in dynamics and the crunchy chords and the arguments. And think how different this is compared to music for a while. <coughs> It's, a, it's completely different, isn't it? And that is how, how much music has changed, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this round. Take, yes, Ned's finally taking off his coat. That makes me happy. Put <laughs> um, your scores down, get comfy. This is obviously a longer piece. <laughs> so I think this is more like I've already deserved another big round of applause.
Is it different when you say it live? Actually, I think you guys had an even better view, didn't you? You do the same to people. That is such a difficult piece of music. That was awesome, Mr. Morales. Thank you so much. I hope that you were able to pick out the one, two, three, four, five, six, and the different sections of it. So it's starting for year 10, starts to make a bit more sense. When you don't understand pieces like this, they are boring. I get it. But when you start to understand how they're made and they're built up, it makes a huge difference to how you listen to something. Thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Can we give Mrs. Martin some hand? Well done, everyone.